Yeah, this is an appropriate time for us to hear from the Mayor of Clarkson and um, just also to recognize we've been joined by uh, Senator Vincent Ford in the room and we'll give you some time uh, to back over to the General Assembly. But, uh, Mayor, tell us about what's going on in your neck of the woods. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'd be interested, just, just for the benefit of the population, to understand the framework of the law that you passed, which doesn't decriminalize marijuana because it is illegal in the state of Georgia, but it changes the um, the fine structure and so forth. So if you could give an overview for the benefit of everyone that may not be aware of that, and then talk about what your your police, or I'm sorry, your population in jail was like before the law and after that law, I think that'd be helpful. Probably happy to. Thank you very much, uh, council members and uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Clarkson began looking at this uh, this paradigm uh, in criminal justice reform, you know, state only offense, uh, way back in 2015. Uh, we, um, uh, quite frankly, we had new council members who got elected who said that you know we have to take a stance on what. Uh, the larger community was uh, protesting and rallying and, and speaking out against uh, related to Black Lives Matter, uh, criminal justice reform, and it was clear at the time that there was no movement happening at the federal or state level on this, these, these issues. And so we said, what, what can we do in our community? Uh, we formed a, a study committee, uh, just like this one. Uh, we spent almost six months uh, bringing in experts, public health, uh, criminal justice reform, um, heard from actually very different viewpoints um, and came to this conclusion that it's the only offense made sense in Clarkson. So I, I really applaud you all for doing your due diligence and uh, bringing in uh, experts uh, to give their point of view. I agree with a lot of what Mr. Davis said. Um, we decided to uh, pass our ordinance in July of, um, of 2016. And it's been eight months now. Uh, I'm happy to report that Clarkston has not become a drug haven, <laughs> uh, which were some of the concerns that people, you know, quite frankly said would happen. Um, our ordinance is, is pretty straightforward. We lowered the fine to what had been around a 600 up to a thousand dollar fine in municipal court. And the scenario of um, how most of these uh, penalties were adjudicated. Um, and the scenario that was most common was someone would be pulled over for a traffic issue. So a headlight out, a taillight out, turning right on red, running a red light, um, a whole myriad of traffic-related offenses. Uh, officer would come up to the window, window would come down, officer would smell marijuana, and then say, we need to search your vehicle, and the search would begin. Anything that was found under an ounce or over an ounce, didn't matter what it was, uh, and our policy was an arrestable offense. Um, the person was taken to DeKalb County Jail. And so this is something a little bit different than what y'all are dealing with. Um, we, we have um, maybe two holding cells in our police department, uh, but the DeKalb County Jail is the jail that, that houses anyone who's arrested in um, Someone's car would then be towed. Um, there's another fee associated with covering your car, and my understanding of most of the cases before the, our ordinance passed, um, someone could spend anywhere between a day and three days um, in the county jail before they were uh, bailed out. Um, they had the option to go ahead and pay to be bailed out immediately by paying the fine, um, which uh, was set at $1,000, just standard. Uh, it could be reduced later in the missile court, um, the judge and the solicitor's Process. Um, so we address the issues of it being an excessively punitive fine, um, the issue of adding another you know, $200 towing impoundment fee, and then the possibility of someone uh, missing their work uh, for a day, two days, three days. Uh, it seemed to be sort of this compounding effect um, of having a blowback in the community. Um, we, uh, so this has been eight months now. We've actually seen a decline. Um, so in the past, we were seeing between 40 and 50 arrests uh, in, a, in a fiscal year on average. Um, the revenues that we were getting from this actually were significant. So if you look at a $600 to $1,000 fine spread out over you know, 40 um, offenses, 
we're t talking close to thirty up to forty thousand dollars in a year, and it, it was an important, uh, tough decision to to work our way through. Uh, Clarkston has a five million dollar budget, so y'all probably spend more on you know, sidewalk <laughs> little strips than we spend in our entire budget. Um, and at the same time, we were debating whether to fund the community center struggling to come up with 20,000 for our community center at the time. Um, but the way we viewed it uh, is a twofold, a practical response to how it's actually gonna impact people's you know, pocketbooks. Um, and then just the, the larger movement to actually implement community policing that would not just be the simply, we're gonna park, we're gonna walk around community policing, but to really change the dynamic uh, that was happening uh, between sort of these nonviolent um, I would say victimless crimes that were occurring. Uh, so we lowered the fine to $75. Um, we, uh, we indicated in the ordinance that it would not be an arrestable offense for this standalone simple possession. Um, and then the final thing is to give officer discretion. And that was really important for our, our police because um, you know, we can't uh, legislate wholesale for every single thing that might happen up there out there on the streets. And I can just tell you right now, um, just anecdotally, two issues that occurred just last week in Clarkston. Uh, we get a weekly report from our police chief and we asked him, you know, we asked her to flag um, uh, anything related to the marijuana possession charge. And so two different instances happened. Um, one person was pulled over for a taillight that was out. Officer um, approached the vehicle, uh, smelled marijuana, you know, conducted a search. The, the driver admitted up front, yep, I've got marijuana in here, it's a small amount, it's right here. And so the ticket was given for the headlights and then for the marijuana possession and then the person was on the way. Um, so they were given a ticket and they continued on with their, their business. Um, they'll have to come back to court or, or pay the fine, of course. Um, a second person, uh, similar situation, there was a uh, suspended license um, previous week. Uh, the officers told um, the driver to take care of it. Um, they were pulled over a week later uh, for something not related, and uh, they, uh, the, the driver uh, basically, uh, um, I don't want to say resisted, but there was an altercation that was in the suit. And so this person was arrested for disorderly conduct. And also upon searching the vehicle, under one ounce of marijuana was found in a, in a vehicle. And so because of the issue that, or the nuance between the municipal code and then what the state law provides, the officer discretion was in effect. So the officer concluded that you know, these, these other charges, so disorderly conduct, um, uh, there was a traffic violation, uh, but there was, it kind of rose to the level of the state crime. And so in consultation with our city attorney, the reason why the officer discretion was so important is that we wanted to make sure that we were not uh, decriminalizing marijuana, because that is against the, the state statute, um, and to not create something that would be considered trivial. And so. Um, in the scenario where um, a state crime is committed, everything has to pull over uh, into the state court violation. The state law applies there. Um, but when the officer believes that this situation is not warrant an arrest or state violation, then the ticket only offense is given. Um, the original uh, ordinance that we first looked at um, addressed the issue of multiple offenses. And so currently in Clarkson, it's just $75 for the first, second, third, uh, does, there's no sort of you know, graduated fine. That was what the council uh, decided was best. Um, the original ordinance said that the first offense would actually be a zero dollar fine, but there would be a $100 marijuana awareness program course that would have to be uh, performed. It's a three hour course, it's a public health approach uh, to this issue, and so we talk about criminal justice reform and not locking someone up and finding them excessively and throwing the keys, 
but to try to give them the resources and the education that they may not have gotten in school, at home, or from the community at large. And so this is less reefer madness, less say just say no, and more about the health consequences of marijuana use, driving under the influence, things like that. And so, and then we discussed a, a graduate fine for Senator and so it go up a little higher. Um, and so we didn't take that route. Um, the council voted for the $75. Um, the uh, final one thing I'll one final thing I'll say, the um, uh, Fifty dollars and below would have been considered a trivial fine, just in cons consultation with our city attorney. So that's why we settled on the seventy-five dollars. It's not trivial; um, it's still you know, relatively significant for some people. If you're talking about a minimum wage worker; um, that's you know, almost a day's work. So um, uh, seventy-five dollars seems low. It certainly is lower compared to six hundred to a thousand dollars. But we decided not to go below fifty to not. Uh, give the appearance that we were de facto decriminalizing this issue. Well, Mayor Terry, thank you for walking us through that. That was extremely helpful, um, particularly the two scenarios where the officer discretion could come into play and the other scenario where it didn't need to, uh, the trivial uh, $50. I mean, that, that, that's very helpful in giving this council some guidance on your thoughts as you, you and your council got to this point and examples were very helpful. Um, I know I had uh, Council President Mitchell and then Ms. Adrian, and also we've been joined by uh, Councilmember Kwanzaa Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mayor Terry, thank you for being here. I think your presence is very helpful. I think uh, what you have uh, been working on with your colleagues uh, and the citizens of Clarkson really provides, I think, a strong framework. Uh, what I thought I heard you saying, I want to make sure I'm not too far apart. Of course, you and I have talked about this uh, specific issue. Uh, on occasion uh, is that number one uh, your current ordinance acknowledges uh, that uh, you don't want to send the signal that you're decriminalizing it or making it you know legal uh, because of some prevailing public health considerations and then number two uh, that you understand that there is a state law uh, that if in place and that's the only uh, law in place regulating the use of marijuana uh, would eliminate the discretion of your officers. Am I correct in saying both of those things, or do, do I need to get some clarity? Uh, that's right, yes. So just the, I think it may come up, but the, the 1983 state statutes um, gives current jurisdiction to the municipal court on how to punish less than one ounce possession. Um, and so you're exactly right. The, anything too trivial of a fine could, could be considered decriminalizing it. Yes, so that would be in violation of state law. That was the legal interpretation. I mean, it's open for, I mean, uh, you know, courts can decide those things if it came to that. Um, and what was the second piece? And, then, and the, the second piece was you seem to allude to uh, really kind of a public health, social mores perspective of not wanting to send a certain signal as well uh, by completely legalizing it. In addition to not wanting to be in violation of state, until the state law obviously is changed by the state legislature, um, you know. You don't want to send a signal on the, on the legal side uh, in a violation of state law. But you also seem to allude uh, to some public health concerns and even some social worry concerns that may have bubbled up from your citizen. Yeah, um, and so just in the public health context, uh, I serve on the DeKalb Board of Health, and I think one of my colleagues is here to speak from a public health perspective. But my um, sort of thought from the public health perspective is that you want to uh, try to divert risky behavior. And driving, so this is so most of the instances that we you know, that happened in, in Clarkston were uh, were driving instances. And I think the the safest route, in my opinion, was to make sure that everyone has the knowledge. So we shouldn't punish someone uh, just because they don't know. And and the the idea of not finding someone just to collect you know revenues from the city, but actually diverting this into something where they have to sit down for three hours. And take a course from a, a, a trained public health professional that will walk through the health effects, um, consequences of driving under the influence of marijuana. Um, and I think uh, the least we could do is make sure everyone has 
uh, all the information to make the most important decision. And that, I'm, I'm glad you said that. I think that's helpful for me. I think that's helpful uh, for those who are listening and are very concerned about about this issue. Uh, it's something that you also said, and I, and I know you've got the agenda, Mr. Chair, and I, and, and, and I definitely want to respect that. Um, but there are two other things that I, I, I hear kind of that you touched on uh, that I think are important to note. Um, and number one is, and I, and I see this to some degree, and I don't want to put words in the mouth of our police chief, uh, but you seem to allude to uh, some similar thinking, which I agree with, is that uh, you didn't want to see uh, marijuana arrests being used as a tool for one of two things. Number one, uh, to bootstrap uh, to other types of offenses into an arrest, uh, which I think is uh, very, a very appropriate concern. And then number two, you alluded to the fact when you talked about the fact that you all have two jail cells uh, that you did, and the considerations regarding uh, the revenue impact. You don't want to see this used as a tool to generate money. Uh, and I think that's a concern that's been raised uh, in this setting and around the country. Uh, and I, I want to get your, your, your feedback on, on, on that. Uh, and then I'm going to make my last comment and then we can move on. But it sounds like you, you, you acknowledge the fact uh, that, that the behavior of um, is one thing, but then the utilization of the consequences to raise money uh, and to use it as a tool to bootstrap, bootstrap was a concern that you all sought to eliminate. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think the best way I can address that is um, it's things that um, Michelle Alexander has talked about in her book that was referenced earlier in the video. Um, the, the concurrent jurisdiction law was passed in 1983. In March of 19, I was born in March of 1983, so this is how far back it goes. Um, but this was during the Reagan administration, and uh, and there was a big push back then to say, well, if we want to stop all these drug crimes from happening. We just need to throw the book at them and make it so punitive that someone will just not do it because it'll be so hard to, to, to handle. It'll be too much money. And I think, uh, I suspect that there were cities that's, that were arresting people under these new federal state drug laws and all that money was going to the state. And if you look at a lot of municipalities budgets and where they get the revenues from, and Clarkson's they're different, um, a large portion of the budget is funded through police fine citations. Um, and, and so just, like we were collecting almost forty thousand a year from that one that one charge. Um, I, I I think I surmise that there was um, someone saying there's a lot of money over there and our city deserves to get it. And clearly, you know, thirty four years later, it it ain't working. <laughs> you know that punitive fine just isn't working. And so, you know, it's probably a good moment to consider something. Thank you very much. One of the things you mentioned was um, driving while under the influence, and so I'm curious uh, how the police officer learns whether the person, I mean, it's one thing to have possession of your car, which under this ordinance would be a fine, but if a person's driving under any influence, whether it's alcohol, drugs, or marijuana, then they become there, there could be a victim, right? Because it's driving under the influence. So how does the officer tease that out when someone, they smell it, um, you know, how do they learn whether the person's under the influence? Uh, I'm not an expert on how the field tests um, are performed, but I, my understanding is that there is a, a test that's performed, and this is where the officer expression comes into play. Okay, and then the other thing I'd asked you, um, you, had, you said you had 40 to 50 arrests per year prior to July uh, of 2016 um, adopting your ordinance. What, what are the number of arrests now? So as of December, which is the last report I got, there were 22. 22 for just straight possession. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, not, not arrests, just tickets. We have tickets. I do want to also mention that we, we have uh, representatives from the Atlanta Public School System here. Uh, 
here for Morris Long as well as Wayne Martin, um, as this is an issue that's important to them as well. Um, and if we don't have any other questions for you, uh, Mayor Terry, uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And I, I imagine that we'll be calling on you uh, more uh, you know, as we go through this process. So we appreciate your open openness. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.